myself. Yes, I took mine. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I, I see there are still some people in the back hesitating whether they should join or not our panel. Uh, maybe just a few words before we start. Uh, this panel will be on technology for social good, and we will be exploring how startups are creating impact today and um, how they can uh, you know, catalyze even more impact and what is the role of other stakeholders in the ecosystem. If you have some friends who are out there not sure whether they should keep on having their lunch or join an interesting discussion, you should definitely message them and tell to, to join the plenary session. Uh, by the way, we are part of the Global Shapers community. Um, we already uh, presented that at the very beginning. We are here for Hack for a Cause, which is a one and a half day long uh, line of sessions, uh, inspirational talks, panel discussion, and also co-creation sessions. So uh, just be mindful that we'll be here in the plenary still this afternoon and also tomorrow. Uh, so feel free to pop by and, and be with us to get even more inspired at this great uh, event today. All right, um, we are already there, so I'm not sure whether we should have the, the music <laughs> to start off the panel or whether we should just uh, go straight into that. I'll probably do that because that would be awkward. <laughs> but uh, yeah, hello everyone. I have, as you might have understood, I'm the moderator and I find it a bit strange to be sitting in the middle, but I've been told it could be actually nice to sit around all the speakers. Uh, I will then try to start maybe from the left-hand side and just introduce or um, get you the, the microphone to introduce yourself. And uh, I would love all of you to just uh, say a few words about you and especially to tell us uh, what is your connection or how you are related with the topic of technology for social good. Well, hi everyone. Hi everyone. Yeah, there we go. Um, my name is Laura. I'm from Germany. I have a background in physics, namely biophysics. And I am currently working as a quantitative consultant in financial risk advisory. That is also why I deal a lot with the topics of data, data quality, data storage, but, but also um, how to use machine learning in order to improve my predictions algorithms uh, that I am creating um, during my day job. And then furthermore, I am in the leading position for various initiatives tackling digital inclusion projects um, for youth, but also for adults in the southern Germany region. Hey, everyone. Uh, an honor to be here. My name is Christopher Lee. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts in the US. Um, I, my background is in healthcare. Um, I hold a PhD in the joint Harvard-MIT Health Sciences and Technology program, uh, specializing in biomedical engineering. I'm also a co-founder of a company called Infinite MD. Uh, we're a digital health company. We connect patients anywhere in the world to specialists online for remote virtual opinions. Um, so we only deal with patients in specialty medicine. Uh, I've, we've, I've always been inspired in using healthcare to inspire social good, and one of the verticals that InfinMD is currently pursuing is providing patients that would otherwise not have access to a specialist the ability to have a no-cost second opinion. Uh, and we've developed this programming in certain disease-specific areas and looking to expand it elsewhere. Uh, excited to be here today and to uh, talk about my experiences in this area in healthcare. 
Thank you, Christopher. Hera. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Hera from the Philippines. Uh, I'm more of an ecosystem builder. I'm co-chair of Ocean Summit PH, which is actually a biannual gathering that brings together cross-sector leaders to talk about new ideas and um, cr uh, encourage cross-sector collaboration. Uh, I've been in the corporate uh, space for nine years. Mainly, I've been um, in the space of philanthropy. So I used to have um, an initiative to, uh, to rebuild areas that got hit by the super typhoon Haiyan, basically um, that include interventions in health, livelihood housing, and, and education. And a big part of that experience allowed me to really see the role of business in in shaping the communities they're in. So right now, uh, I recently became part of um, Antler in Singapore that allows me to, to learn more about how to revolutionize the way we allow entrepreneurs to scale. So basically, it's a lot of reinventing the way we use mobile phones to, to power um, a lot of like offline retail in the Philippines. Javad? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Javad Mushtaq. Uh, I am the son of an immigrant, uh, born and raised up in the core north in a country called Norway. Um, I uh, started in, in my, my career in an energy corporation. Uh, I dropped out uh, last year. Um, on the side, I've started a few social enterprises focusing on education, youth, on diversity and inclusion. And right now, I'm working for an impact investment organization called Catapult, uh, which is investing in impact tech-based startups. Uh, we have, in the past uh, three years, through our Global Accelerator program, invested in 50 startups uh, from all over the world. Um, and we are launching between five to 10 accelerator programs in Africa within this uh, next year. Um, I work a lot with systems change uh, work and on developing innovation ecosystems in emerging markets. Um, and I really believe that technology can be a key part of scaling up and solving a lot of the challenges that we're facing as humanity and the world. And uh, what we can do is uh, how can we work on bridging the early stage capital gap that we're facing in a lot of emerging markets to really solve some of the big challenges. And I'm really excited to be part of this panel and, and discuss some of those solutions today. Thank you very much. So as you can see, we have a very diverse uh, panel today. Um, I'm super happy to start off this uh, discussion and the first question I would like to ask you is since you all come from different countries, you have such diverse backgrounds, could you maybe uh, make an example of a tech company uh, that is really creating social impact today, maybe in your specific country or region and, and give us a little bit of inspiration? Um, so the usage of digital technology to tackle complex um, processes, oh, no, not processes, but complex issues um, for in the society um, is a rather novel one. However, it's gaining a lot of momentum um, in the past, past decades. And um, there are actually two projects that I find really impressive and that I would like to highlight. Uh, the first one actually is a project that is um, based in Nigeria and um, there is a bunch of girls who actually just received last year the technology of award of the Silicon Valley for developing a fake drug detection app. Um, I find this very, very interesting because first of all, it's a group of girls who did not have any prior yeah, knowledge um, in coding when they started off doing this project. And actually, they are tackling an issue which is, um, uh, which is really deep in the, in the African market that you have um, or where access to um, fake drugs is a, a very big topic and this app that they created actually allows um, to simply scan the barcode of a given of a given drug and thereby identify whether or not um, it is safe to use it and of course this leads to uh, the prevention of, of death and of other diseases which evolve from taking wrong medication. And then another one that I really, really do enjoy, and it has become a startup already, is um, that uh, you ca can actually use your phone, your phone camera, um, to support the visually impaired. Um, turn the smartphone camera basically into 
um, a smart guide. Um, it allows you to scan the room and um, visually impaired people will have an easier time finding objects um, that they may have displaced. So actually, it's also an app that all of us could potentially use, I guess. <laughs> uh, how is this app called? It's Panda. Panda, OK. Panda, yeah. OK, cool. Um, I, I really liked her particular point around the idea of uh, technology confluence. You know, I'm, I'm an engineer, and um, I, f I feel like the takeaway at the end of the day when you go to study engineering is how to bring things together. So let's use the context of my company, which is a digital health company connecting patients. I didn't invent any of the individual co components, or rather we didn't invent any of the individual components. We did not invent the concept of video conferencing. There are tools that we use for that. We didn't invent the concept of digitalizing CT scans and putting them online for physicians to access. That was already readily developed. We just found ways to bring all of these different aspects of existing technology together in a very meaningful way. Um, and one thing that we found particularly interesting is you know, we've been trying to do these social programs where we provide a patient that might not have access to an expert the ability to speak to someone that is a clinical expert relative to the condition that they have. And a lot of these patients are just coming to us organically. Um, my, co my business partners and I just the other day were discussing how we think maybe inadvertently Google searches have probably saved more lives than anything else in the world because the first thing, if you don't feel well, what do you do? You go to Google and you Google some stuff, right? And I find myself doing that even though I've been in healthcare my entire life. And so when we've instituted these programs where we provide patients the ability to speak to these experts for free, we've actually needed very little outbound marketing. We needed actually very little SEO we found that most of this demand is coming to us very organically, and there are just a number of patients that are just directly coming to us. So I guess in summary, what I was trying to say is that you know, the confluence of technologies, particularly ripe sort of in this time, and in some of my personal experience, I've been able to see that you know, a lot of these sort of inadvertent ways of coming across, for example, our services are already there. Great. Are you guys, uh, can you also think of some examples? Yeah, for a bit of inputs from the ASEAN market, which is actually a hotbed for social impact initiatives, just because we have a lot of social issues. And a lot of these things stem about a lot of um, frustration about things. And I have a couple of friends and a, uh, who use this um, frustration, channel this frustration to create things and bring more impact. A group of friends created a startup in India that stemmed out of that frustration um, with the fact that 25% of all cer cervical cancer deaths are from India. And though it's preventable, it happened because a lot of women, because of this general re reluctance and embarrassment about asking about their sexual and, and wellness and, and well-being, and general well-being. And what they did basically is uh, um, they created a chatbot. It, it's, it's a startup that allows you to, to, um, to uh, basically interact with a chatbot that would push really good, well-curated content about your condition that would allow you to um, personally interact with them anytime you want. They push um, very uh, specific um, information. They connect you to non-judgy um, physicians through, a tele to, through telehealth. And that allowed them to, um, and the goal is really to help empower women to, uh, and by empowering their health. Another group I know, um, there's a group of friends, a bunch of travelers, they had a, they, there's a part of their trip where they went to Southeast Asia and experienced a lot of scam. And uh, that got them really frustrated and they created a crowdsource um, incident reporting platform that also, um, that allows travelers to be in the know um, about which areas are safe for you to travel, which areas um, would be more, which would be much better for dining and what would be the necessary mechanisms that you could follow if something happens. Um, another group I know, realizes how it's kind of difficult for millennials to invest. So what they did was, you know, there's a, what they did is a platform that's gonna connect stockbrokers to millennials in a way that makes investing fun. So what they do is they create smaller circles that shows different investment opportunities by theme. So as a millen millennial, investing now becomes fun because you can, you can invest based on, you, you could invest for climate or you could invest for a world of bots or you could invest for, you know, all these different types of initiatives. And you're not only just investing 
thing to reach your lifelong goals, but at the same time for, you know, just for, 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 for the general well-being of the planet. So those are some of the things that, I, those are some of the examples that I, I could think at this point. Great. So uh, I think uh, we just uh, need to kind of understand that uh, when we talk about technology and solutions, it doesn't necessarily have to come from startup itself. It can also come from established companies. And a few examples of that are, uh, if you look at uh, the South Asian market with uh, Pakistan and, and Bangladesh uh, combined, uh, there are 350 million people. Uh, now you have a huge amount of the population which are unbanked and you have a huge amount of people who, are, uh, who doesn't have a documentation to, to actually create a bank account. So when you looked at one of the, the largest telecom operators in the world, they started something called Easy Pesa, which was using mobile technology uh, because they have a very high mobile penetration rate in those countries, 75% in Pakistan, and a similar rate in Bangladesh as well. They could provide an option, an alternative to a lot of younger people to actually get access to financial transactions and getting paid out. So you're kind of tackling an issue where you have a huge amount of the population which is uh, unbanked and, and don't have documentation, but still can get access to financial transactions um, and financial inclusion. Uh, another example that we've uh, worked slightly with, which is based on kind of some of the similar examples of telemedicine, is based out of Pakistan. So you have a startup called Doctors, and uh, the startup was looking into uh, two problems in, in Pakistan. One was uh, there's a lot of uh, female who get educated, highly educated. A lot of them are educated as doctors, but tend to be uh, at home after they're educated because they want to prioritize family, etc. And on the other hand side, you have a lot of rural areas which don't have access to uh, medical advice or, or doctors at all. So now, how can you use uh, technology and telemedicine as a platform to combine these people who can sit at home, who are highly educated women uh, doctors in Pakistan, to connect them with rural areas? It's another way of looking at technology. At the same time as uh, we can't uh, just look at technology as a solution to uh, the developing and emerging markets, technology can also be very good at uh, the developed markets. And if you look into Norway, which is uh, where I'm born and raised, um, you see that there is a huge uh, problem with an aging population and a lot of loneliness and a mental health crisis. And then you have another group which has had a huge influx into the, the region, uh, which is the refugees, uh, which started coming a few years back, who are also sitting uh, at the refugee asylum places, not having any work and also suffering a lot of integration issues and mental health problems. Now, there was a solution which connected and created a technological platform which connected these older people who needed somebody to talk to and, and have kind of a friend on one side, and you had refugees who need to learn the language and also were feeling lonely and connected those two through uh, this platform. And suddenly you're solving a mental health and loneliness issue, which is a huge problem in aging society. So in a lot of senses, technology uh, can be used as a catalyst to solve a lot of the challenges we have. But we also have to be a bit humble and understanding about that technology doesn't always have to be the solution. Uh, it can be really good to solving the problems and scaling up. But in some regions, technology is not the first answer. Uh, it can be the second or third kind of stage. Javed, since you mentioned, you, you made some examples, uh, both from like emerging economies and developed countries. What do you guys think would be the main differences when it comes to tech startups? Um, you know, what are the characteristics of tech startups in developed countries and in emerging markets? So uh, from, from my perspective, uh, I mean, we're based out of Norway and we're investing in global impact tech startups. And we've mainly invested from the Western world because they ha tend to have good mature ecosystems and a, 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 at least a fundamental understanding of how to commercialize and scale up the startups. When you go into a continent like Africa, we have 54 countries and a lot of them uh, are on a very different understanding in terms of um, uh, commercializing a startup and scaling it up, you need to start on a very kind of different angle. You can't start by saying that use technology and create commercial startups. You need to start by creating education and awareness around entrepreneurship, around commercialization, around how to scale it up. And then you need to kind of help kind of support a lot of the early stage capital gap that we, we're facing as well. And, and thirdly, which we faced a lot in uh, our work in Africa was, especially in, in uh, Nigeria, was technology is not always the solution. Uh, we come in with this mindset that technology is going to solve anything, and then we start talking to a lot of the entrepreneurs which are on the ground, and they start saying that, uh, yes, but our basic problems are not necessarily you know, uh, creating a digital platform. It's to get basic sanitation facilities. 
And that's not very technological in any sense at all, but that's necessary. Uh, but we can look at how technology can help scale up those solutions. So I think we just need to be a bit kind of humble about when we go into this emerging market that technology is right. not necessarily the answer. Right. Hera, what yeah, is your um, take? Yes. Uh, for, for the side of the Philippines, uh, basically a lot of the, and, and the rest of, I think it applies to a lot of like countries in Southeast Asia as well. A lot of the efforts in building tech companies are really hinged on the need to transition to more digital infrastructure. But like Javad said, and I love what he said that, uh, about technology not being the answer, um, it's because a lot of us will always think, and when we think of a tech startup, we always think it has to be something amazing, it has to be something intimidating, it has to be like AI, like it's like all these things, data science. But, um, at the end of the day, we always have to go back to the ground and understand what are the problems that we truly need. I mean, there's a lot of this focus, like there's a bit of pressure as well to meld into the existing model of what a tech startup is. So a lot of people make the mistake of bringing in clones of certain startups uh, with a, with the purpose of just really like making it work in that country. But at the end of the day, yes, some of them may, may achieve product market fit given a few tweaks, but at the end of the day, the, the, a lot of mistakes that entrepreneurs make is they focus on the solution and not the problem when they are supposed to focus in the problem because the solution could always change, but the problem is a constant. And um, I'll give you a very um, concrete example, like three um, themes in one example. So it involves um, the retail market. Um, this is in the Philippine setting, the retail market, jobs, and e-payments, for example, yeah, e-payments. Uh, the Philippine retail market is a 95 billion US dollar industry. Out of that number, only, uh, only 1.5 billion is attributable to e-commerce. And that's because in a country like the Philippines, where only 99% uh, of, of the people don't have credit cards and 70% are unbanked, people, like a lot of the, the trade and a lot of retail is still largely driven by word of mouth. And, in fact, nine out of 10 people would, would prefer to listen to friends' recommendations that the ads they see online. And that is something that is a question. Like, you know, in a world where e-commerce is booming and, you know, a lot of like offline sales are growing as well, there are 50 million people in the Philippines that are still looking for opportunities to earn extra money for their family. And what we realized was there's, there's a gap in the market that can actually bring all of these these two different trends so that we could maximize the model like what we what we see as a potential is direct selling for example it's something big like filipinos have the potential to be sticky we you know re human relationship has this potential to 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 really just push products to the market and um, that a lot of people try to disrupt them but their mo this model by um, creating e-payments, e e-wallets. A lot of people tried to bring new fintech solutions. But what a lot of people didn't notice was in a country like the Philippines, cash is still king. So it wasn't until um, you know, cash on delivery services was introduced that e-commerce picked up. And I think for me, this is one example with how really understanding what the problem is really is key to really understanding how to drive the market forward. Amazing. You guys have been uh, also talking about ecosystems, especially Javad, and what came to my mind is, okay, like looking at this ecosystem and the players who are in it, so uh, obviously like corporates and, and the government and, and what is their role in, in making this whole startup, tech startup ecosystem emerge and flourish. Um, so my question to you is, what do you guys think of um, these players and how do you think they should um, interact or not interact uh, with tech startups to, to really help the whole ecosystem grow? I'll maybe start on this side. <laughs> so they most definitely should interact. I mean, in the corporate world um, is actually where all the money lies, where all uh, experience lies, startups can really, really benefit from the exchange and experiences that big corporates already have. Um, of course, they also have to apply it to their own um, field of interest and size it down, but I'm sure that um, startups, yes, they can learn from corporates and there should most definitely be exchange on many different levels. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, 
it's definitely a very, very tough question, I think, to, to, to address in such a short time frame. Um, I, there's, it's multifaceted, right? So as a, on the founder side, you know, I would love, my dream is to have maybe a corporation pick us up and then have an exit. And that's, you know, something that is uh, widely cited as, you know, a success story in terms of exiting a company, right? And so um, there, 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 are, there are merits in that sense. But in terms of uh, the learnings and the expertise, um, I think possibly that's probably the most useful. I mean, as a small company trying to fight for relevancy every single day in the marketplace, um, you know, a large corporation has so much more actual real world, world experience doing something. Um, in the prior panel, when we were just, or in the prior session, we were talking about sustainability and um, sort of out of curiosity, I, I, I decided to see if I could look at my own carbon footprint from using Amazon Prime, right? Because I'm like a big fan of Amazon Prime and I think two-day shipping is wonderful. But then I realized that Amazon is something, uh, you know, as an article was saying that they're only releasing their sustainability report on the effects of the carbon footprint in terms of uh, Amazon Prime delivery this year. And so then my next thought was, well, if I was a company running some sort of a business that required shipping, wouldn't I look to them as a way of, in terms of modeling how I would develop out this business? I shouldn't have to reinvent all of this from scratch. Similarly, in the healthcare business, in the healthcare sector that I operate, operate in, I didn't invent you know, EMR systems from scratch because if I did, every single hospital would have to readopt a whole new thing um, and would actually be very, very difficult to sell them my solution. Um, so I think, you know, at the end of the day, there has to be this, you know, this obviously this partnership that has to occur. But really, I turn to corporations as um, a, a very collaborative partner because there's so much that we can learn from them, which ultimately helps stop small startups become successful. And just a follow up uh, on this, uh, talking about legislation, because we also had a conversation about that. Uh, how do you think, like the the yeah. <laughs> the law could help yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, I have so many thoughts on, on, on the legislative components, too. I mean, um, I, I, I feel like legislation is always very reactive. Um, and you see this, you know, across the technology sector. You see this across healthcare. Usually something bad happens, then it takes time to enact legislation. And by the time in the years that it takes for the legislation to happen, um, the technology has moved on, and so now you have outdated laws governing um, technology that has moved forward. Um, you know, uh, in, in the EU, for example, there's these laws regarding data privacy called GDPR that have made telemedicine and digital health particularly challenging. Um, and as an American in the United States, we're kind of this weird conglomeration of 50 states that are all fit into one giant nation. So you ultimately have sort of local state law and then you have federal law that often come into conflict with each other. Uh, so there are a lot of sort of tech, uh, legislative barriers that you also have to overcome in the digital health space, but also in the sort of techno technological space um, that have become very annoying. Um, but if, as a company, if you figure it out, um, it does help you um, ultimately achieve better product market fit. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Guys, how about you from an ecosystem perspective? What do you think should be the role of these players? Uh, so, so I think the point you raised up uh, with uh, corporations being part of the ecosystem is key. I think we need to kind of look at an ecosystem from a multi-stakeholder perspective where we have a lot of players which have stake in the ecosystem and is helping developing that with different roles, which means that the government play a key role in their sense with legislation, etc. You have corporations which don't necessarily always have the innovation component in-house and they need to go out to get uh, new ideas uh, through open innovation. Uh, they also have the financial backing through corporate venture arms. Uh, so I think we just need to understand that the innovation and startup ecosystem is not necessarily limited just to investors and entrepreneurs who are creating the solutions. Um, now, there needs to be um, a good way to kind of connecting and combining. And we need to understand what a corporation can bring in. And I think a lot of corporations have started to understand kind of the role they can play. Uh, by not necessarily uh, creating a lot of startups or investing in startups, but working very closely with the startup ecosystem. So in Norway, the largest bank has started an in-house accelerator program inviting a lot of fintech startups called DMB Next. 
we have uh, a lot of consulting houses which have started to kind of have the digital and the innovation arm. Uh, we uh, ourselves are collaborating with McKinsey uh, as part of our accelerator program as well. So I think that we're going to find new types of models uh, where we're working together with corporations, uh, with consulting companies, with the government to actually create good solutions. And I think that's key to create systems change in the society and to get, create good world-class startup ecosystems. Uh, we all have a role to play, including the corporations. I think generally entrepreneurs are very passionate people. They're always hungry to build something that's going to help and move forward their own advocacies and the things that they're passionate about. Um, for me, the role of businesses is really in helping give them an extra push. It's the businesses that have access to data. It's the businesses that have access to capital. It's the businesses that knows the problem that knows a lot of the problems that are inherent to society in a much deeper way. And I think businesses would be able to help entrepreneurs do that by pointing. It's easy to be to be derailed if you're an entrepreneur. It's easy, like, I'm so passionate about this. I want to do this. I want to do this. But businesses could have that expertise and have that experience to come in the room and say, no, this is what's needed, this is the data, this is a problem that we're experiencing. If you could come in and create a solution for this, there we're, then we're on to something. Yeah. Right, right. And also talking about data and um, you know, all that comes with technology and, and probably um, what comes with it might not necessarily be always positive, right? So what, what do you think about, um, you know, also AI today and, and how we are also gathering data and what are potentially some um, unintended consequences of, of, of these technology companies. Laura? So um, AI in general, and, and that is something that I really want to point out, is not like the secret we've been waiting for for so long. AI has been there for decades and now it just has been given a new name, basically. So there is a saying, um, we have it when we code, it's like if it's actually written in code, it's called machine learning. If it's on a PowerPoint slide, it's probably AI. Um, that tells you something already. But um, in general, of course, um, using machine learning in different areas can enable us to predict um, different kinds of events ranging from um, the likelihood of a person dying of a disease um, up to like whether or not there's going to be an environmental catastrophe. But in order to do that, we first of all need the data, which has been stated multiple times, and the data has to be of a certain quality. So, and as long as we do not have measures and know what the parameters are, we of course cannot model um, that event that we would like to predict. Um, however, AI can, of course, um, be very, very useful, as um, stated before. Um, I know that also, I think it's in Africa, they have um, an AI-based um, scanner, which actually allows farmers to scan the condition of their plants and thereby identify whether or not the crop has been infected with a disease. And um, this allows them to react much faster and thereby prevent um, prevent starvation and, and, and hunger. Um, but as already stated, um, there is this data. And if we want to live in more comfort, which technology is surely bringing to us, it's making life much more easier. We're, it's much easier to be connected. Um, life is more comfortable. It's way more easier than it used to be to, ed to, uh, to educate yourself about various topics. Um, the price you always pay with that is data. Your personal data will be used in order to train the algorithms, to make them better, to make them more user-oriented. And that is something everyone has to be very aware of and um, has to also um, keep in mind when, when using such, uh, such products. And um, so far, there is a lack um, fr from a governmental side in order to, to, to cope with these new technologies. I think it was already pointed out. Um, for example, if um, there's an incident with, or, yeah, think about self-driving cars. If we have self-driving cars, who's going to be responsible if something happens? Um, who is going to be responsible in that intermediate phase where not everything is smart, but we still have people who, like, 
uh, spontaneously decide whether or not to break. Or, so there will be different stakeholders, and at one point, um, we will have to, or, or it is part and the responsibility of, of the um, government to, to create laws for the responsible usage of data and um, also eliminate these gray zones in, in terms of the uh, different innovations. For sure. Chris, did you happen to come across any unintended consequences of your tech startup? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's the fundamental premise of technology is that when you develop something new, you kind of travel into uncharted territories and by doing so, create new questions, right? I mean, um, uh, we, we are challenged a lot because we sit on you know, um, information regarding people's conditions, whether that's something we can use to help train decision support algorithms, if it's something that we can use to create better guidelines for care. Um, but that's something that in healthcare, I think we've seen for a very, very long time. Um, you know, like a lot of the applications of smart software We've, you know, we've been detecting cardiac arrhythmias for EKGs for decades. That's something that technology has delivered many, many years ago. I think it's just with different types of new technologies, these new discussions are being sparked. On the, you know, my background is in biotech. On the, on the biotech side, there are big, big discussions in the ethics of genetic editing right now. And you know, these are all areas that, of course, you know, I don't have the answer for, for any of this. but because we are traveling into very uncharted territories, to technology that itself is inspiring conversations around um, these topics. I think technology has tremendous power to affect us, but at the same time, you know, a lot of these things are built by well-intentioned innovators, but like any other thing, like technology is also at, not immune to corruption. And I think what's very important right now is for us to see how we can shape it, how we can hone our biases or heal our biases to be able to build technology that's going to forward better agendas in the world. And I think right now, the, a very grounded um, example of that is just all this rampant misinformation online. There's, it's just causing a lot of problems and even like discriminatory and biased algorithms that's affecting us day in and day out. And I hope there's going to be more conversation around it because it's something that has to be constantly part of the process and part of the journey. So uh, I think uh, technology is, is really, really good and it's solving a lot of problems. But sometimes I feel like we're running a bit too fast and really kind of with a very narrow uh, sight to really understand the consequences of technology. And uh, some of them were raised here with uh, you know, uh, biases in data. You have the ethics aspect of it with cars. Or for instance, if you get a new prosthetic arm and, and somebody hacks into your arm and makes you shoot a person, who's liable for that, for instance? All these kind of uh, you know, cases are very interesting to discuss. And sometimes we just need to stop and take a step back and really try to understand the consequences. Now, I know that, for instance, legislation and, and, and new kind of frameworks like GDPR in Europe looks very uh, uh, challenging for a lot of startups at this point of time. But I think when you look at it from a lo long-term perspective, this is really going to help us understand who owns the data, what's kind of the, the wider aspect of it, what's the ethical aspect of it, because we don't truly understand the consequence and the negative sides which technology can also kind of bring on us. And I think we just need to be very aware of that. And I think a lot of governments have started to acknowledge that as well. And we see a lot of uh, governments in Europe who have started to build their national AI strategies now uh, to really build a framework around this and a legislation which can support issues like this as well. But technology is, is creating a lot of opportunities, but we just need to be a bit cautious that there are going to be challenges, and we need to be proactive uh, to, to face those challenges and not reactive. It's interesting that you all, in a way, brought up the question about ethics. And um, for me, it ultimately means, you know, are we actually using technology to improve people's lives, right? So for me, it's ultimately about impact. And also our previous session was, was about the impact and, and linkage with the sustainable development goals. Um, I would like to know from you, do you, can you think of any ways that technology um, could actually be used 
even better or should you know lead to you know an even larger overall social impact what could be those triggers what we are you know maybe in a way still missing um, that could really help uh, pushing the boundaries in that direction I think it's like from my end and coming from my own lens uh, it's more how do we use all the outside the ecosystem and how do we use all the outside factors to push and to grow technology in a way that we want them to because right now technology whether we like it or not will grow and will constantly evolve the question right now is how do we use existing systems how do we use existing infrastructures organizations government corporates to make sure that it goes to the right direction so i think that's the that's the bigger question to reflect on mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer of not reinventing the wheel, right? I mean, you know, you see, you see the, the, the emergence of all these on-demand applications, for example. And these applications are only successful because GPS technology has improved substantially over the last 10 to 15 years, right? And so um, there's always a timing with everything, too. There are successful... Uh, there, there, I'm sorry, there are entrepreneurs that potentially would have had successful companies, but they came up with the idea a little too ahead of the curve, and because the other supporting infrastructure wasn't there, um, they ultimately didn't find the product market fit that they probably desired. And so I think the, the key really is to recognize what's available and what can be brought together in a way that creates value rather than going out there and just blindly applying technology, you know, just blindly using, you know, blindly, blindly applying things that are available uh, uh, and sort of using these buzzwords or whatever um, to, to do something. There's so much that's readily available that can be put together um, in an effective way. And also on the level of users, there needs to be much more education on technology. So, um, for example, um, kids will naturally grow up with technology nowadays and they really have to be aware um, not only on how to use, for example, computers, how to um, handle them, uh, which is also still missing in many of the school systems around the world, um, but also how to be responsible in the usage of them and that's not only something that is out there for the startups and for the, the big corporations who are developing those tools, but there should also be an increased focus on how to well educate the end users. Absolutely. Uh, I think from my side, I think just want to echo kind of the fragmentation part and that a lot of people are starting their own new solutions to everything. Look into kind of existing platforms, existing solutions to really create what is creating the most possible impact. How can you impact as many people as possible in a positive way, not just create another new solution? That's the first thing. I think the second thing, which was just mentioned now uh, on the lifelong learning part and the role of the hum human person and the, the, in, in, in the whole technological aspect is what role are we going to play? And too often we are very short-sighted in terms of that uh, we say that we need to be technology savvy and ergo we need to learn how to code. But maybe in five or ten years the machine can code themselves. So what's the, really the role that we're going to play? And really to understand the things that make humans unique in that sense, our complex problem solving skills, our critical thinking, our create, creative thinking, and, and how we're going to function along with the machines to reduce inefficiencies, to create even better solutions, I think is going to be key. And that needs to be on the agenda as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I would like maybe now to uh, see whether there is anyone from the audience who would have some additional questions from our panelists. Uh, it will be also interesting to hear your views on, on how technology can contribute to um, creating social impact and uh, yeah, maybe you have any direct questions to some of our panelists. I see one hand, two hands over there. Uh, 
Um, my name is Aisha and I'm a medical student. Um, I, I was very interested in what you were talking about regarding the ethics and healthcare and technology in healthcare. And I was wondering uh, what your thoughts on, on technology eliminating some of the ethical issues that we face now. So for instance, you know, now in the, in the media we hear about um, the 3D printed heart and how you know, that's going to be the future as opposed to transplantation. So I just wanted your thoughts on that. I think that's for you, Chris. Yeah, um, fascinating. Um, so I think there's, I mean, if you look into, you know, so much of technology is, is what grabs people's attention, right? Um, I, I think, you know, there, for example, if you look at 3D printing, um, I think it's an amazing piece of technology that's been invented, but I think sometimes its applications and its usefulness are sort of blown out of proportion, right? I mean, uh, you, I, I think I see this a lot in, in headlines. Like, for example, uh, a couple years ago, there was a big paper that came out about how a bunch of scientists found a way to derive um, pancreatic islet cells for the, uh, in the pancreas from stem cells. And that was obviously a big deal. It was in a big name publication. But when uh, news outlets grab, sort, grab a hold of that headline, they said that scientists had cured diabetes, um, which is a big gap between in terms of, OK, we found a way to, to, to develop a novel research platform that we can do experimentation on versus the actual complete 100% treatment of a particular disease. Um, so I guess long story short, what I'm trying to say um, is that I think a, a lot of sort of new and upcoming technologies um, might not necessarily ultimately make it in the sense that we still have to follow the fundamentals of getting a medical innovation into people, which is the bench science followed by the, the animal preclinical animal models followed by the real life clinical trials. And, and so I think um, although a lot of these technologies will ultimately come into prominence and into relevance, I do think some of them are more attention-grabbing headlines rather than actual sustainable treatments for diseases and conditions uh, in the future. I don't know if that necessarily answers your question fully. Um, yes, I suppose. Um, I was more interested in the ethical um, questions that we have and how those are the, the conversations around um, different treatments and modalities of treatments are changing as a result of technology, so. Yeah, okay, I mean, sure. I mean, I think like in terms of the ethics aspect, um, I mean, I'm by no means an expert, but um, a lot of it is surrounding the sort of the, the, the ways that humans are being involved into the studies, right? Because now a lot of these, you know, genetic editing things are testing, uh, are, are, are going to be pervasive throughout the person's life. You're testing on an embryo, right? Whereas um, there, there are no way, there are conventional sort of clinical studies don't apply where you can sign up a healthy volunteer, see if it's actually toxic or not. All this is kind of out the window. Um, so I think a lot of these answers are going to be developed over time. I don't think necessarily I'm the most qualified to, to address the ethics aspects of it, but it is a, an interesting field to follow. Okay, thank you so much. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Um, hi, I have a question from Jawad. Uh, you mentioned about female doctors, overly qualified female doctors in countries like Pakistan, for example, and them not being able to go to rural areas, for example, or practice as how should they be, basically. So in that situation, how do you think technology can help solve that? or what are the implications for that? So uh, there are actually quite a, a few solutions in, in Pakistan right now. One of them is called Doctors, another one is called Sehat Kahani. And the way they're doing that, because obviously there's a cultural aspect involved, uh, a lot of women get uh, highly educated, but then it's culturally um, uh, you know, required for them to get married and, and get the stable life, which means that a lot of them are choosing away these careers which are um, in the medical sector. Uh, what Sehat Kahani and doctors are doing is they're using this platform where you have uh, telemedicine, you have uh, video conferencing uh, on one side, where they can sit at home uh, and they can use their skill set to provide access to um, medical advising or, or you know, things that you can do through telemedicine for rural areas which don't have access to any doctors at all. So that's how they're solving this issue uh, through technology. Yeah, that's a really good uh, solution. but. For example, in rural areas, 
do you think they would have access to internet and the facilities required to actually use this platform? So, uh, so you're right that there will be areas where you don't have access to technology. But if you look to a country like Pakistan, uh, which has almost 75 to 80 percent mobile penetration rate, so almost everybody has smartphone penetration rate, which means that almost everybody has a smartphone, and data is relatively cheap, which means that you can provide access uh, to even those in, in the rural areas through those technologies. Uh, yes, there are still areas which you don't have access. Uh, and uh, uh, we're looking into solution on how we can kind of reach those as well. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are just right on time to take probably one additional question from the public. If there is anyone else who would like to probably express their thoughts. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, my question might be a little bit more basic or fundamental, but I would love to hear your views on this. Um, what do you think would be successful uh, strategies in terms of how to identify a problem and how to identify a solution for such problems? I know very open-ended, but uh, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts on this. I have a very simple answer to that question, probably almost an existential one, but how I normally do it would be, I ask myself what irritates me most about the world? Because that will also give you, kind of point you to what you're very passionate about. And going back to, that an to my answer to the previous question, focus on the problem because the solution will change, but the problem remains the same. Asking myself what irritates me most about the world actually also points me, hey, okay, so if things are not, for example, like in, in the Philippines, in e-commerce, a lot of things are just purely manual. And that will already like give you a sign, hey, maybe there's actually a way to like bring technology to actually digitize some of the stuff that are just recurring stuff and non-value adding. So a seller could just focus on selling or doing the thing that she does best, which is selling. So I feel like that is also, um, that is something that I always ask myself. Another thing that I do is use the word truly. That's actually my favorite word. So when I reflect on an issue or a problem, I ask myself, do I understand this? And I would know the, the answer that I get. And then the next thing I would do is I would ask myself, do I truly know this? Do I truly understand this? Just insert the word truly, and maybe it will give you a bit, of, a bit, a bit deeper perspective about it. There, there's a, uh, it's actually funny that you mentioned that I actually went to school. I actually went to school. There's some programs for this in healthcare. They're called biodesign, and um, it's, you know, my panels have essentially hit this on the head. I think uh, several times today. It's essentially identifying a problem needs identification. Um, then you have to under, understand all the different stakeholders, all the users. Um, actually, if you look at the companies that we all respect today. They, they, you know, like Netflix didn't start out doing streaming, right? Yeah. They, they hated late fees, so they solved the problem of late fees. They did that incredibly well, um, so they were focused and solving a problem that they had identified. They solved it incredibly well, and then that gave them the flexibility to then scale into the other businesses that were in. I mean, say with Amazon, right? When Amazon started, they were trying to get rid of bookstores. I mean, the, everything else spawned out of that, but they were laser focused as sort of an e-commerce platform for books, right? And so, all, but ultimately, they were trying to solve the problem that people didn't really want to go to a bookstore and all the other stuff. So I think. Long story short again, it's the identification of a problem, really understanding the problem, iterating, ideating, and then iterating on, of it, on all of it. It sounds trite, but um, it is a tried and true strategy because there are a number of companies that we all have come to respect today that followed that path. So just to kind of follow very briefly up on that as well. So when you identify the problem, I think the solution should be either you can do it at a cheaper price than anybody else is doing, or you can do it at a better way. If you can do that in any of those senses, then you will have a potential market for you. So uh, really kind of looking into both identifying and understanding the problem on one hand side, uh, understanding data, understanding the stakeholders, understanding the systems, and then understanding how you can solve it better than everybody else, because that's going to be your leverage. I'll just add something very quick. Because we're out of time. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very important to know the problem. 
and there are a lot of problems. It's like, I, I just realized in a country like the Philippines, we have a lot of problems, but find a problem you're very passionate about. Because being an entrepreneur, it's, it's actually a hell of a ride. And you need to be there in the ups and the downs. And if you're not passionate about what you're doing, it's not gonna, you're not, it's not gonna pan out well, so. And on these last words, guys, because I see our uh, technicians already are coming forward, I'm just scared that they will kick us out from the panel. I really would like to thank you for all of your insights and your interventions. Uh, I would also invite, like to invite the audience to you know, just uh, come to us, ask also questions bilaterally. I think all of us will be happy to, uh, to continue the conversation also outside of here. Thank you very much. Yes, let's take a picture. Uh, like this? You stand? Okay. Yeah, just. Yeah, I'm just gonna kick it off. Okay. Yep.
All right, so now there was perfect. The ending of the last session was the perfect bridge towards the new one because now we're moving to becoming more interactive. Fine. So we're gonna work through a design dash. Now I don't know whether many of you have been working with design dashes before. Who has? I see one arm up in the air. Oh, so that's fantastic. So now the session will be interactive and the work. We will be working with you through defining problems and then leading through up to solutions. And to do that, I would like to welcome on stage Robin Wenninger, who is one of the specialists in this field and helps, especially in Germany, large international corporates to define problems and lead that through. Yeah, welcome. Beautiful to have you all here. So this is a purely interactive session. So we will just guide you through the session. And for that, we need teams of either two or four people. So if you can team up, that would be beautiful. So move a little bit together. Who wants to work together? It doesn't matter who you are. We are solving the big problems of the SDG on industry, infrastructure, and innovation. So who wants to work with us on that? So we have one. One here. <laughs> so we need a team partner for you. Who wants to move over there? So we just shuffled you all a little bit together. Great, so just find yourself teams. So who is another team leader? Over there, so we have a team over there. Make yourself okay. comfortable wherever you want. We just want to understand where the teams are. You're joining one of those teams. You're okay. joining the team here. You're joining a the team there. Fantastic. So you're here together in one team? That's one. Fantastic. Yeah. Take the time to introduce yourself and get to know each other. How about you two in the back? You want to join? No, you don't want to join? How about you? OK. So we have, can I get the uh, remote, please? So it's one, two. two. Over there, the gentleman. You want to join? <laughs> All right, so either this team or that team. You want to join as well? No? <laughs> OK, fantastic. Just choose a team. We do a one four team and one five team. That's fine. So design dashes are one of the things that I love to work most with to get started on ideas. It's the easiest way to come up in around 50 minutes with a prototype that might have the potential to change the world forever. And I've run now probably over 100 design dashes over the last years. It was originally designed by um, our friends at the HPI Institute in Berlin. And the, the simple idea behind it is to come from a problem perspective and find solutions for these things. And we will guide you through five steps, all timed, on the screen, and you are going to work on that. And hopefully you come up with a prototype of your idea, which will be most likely on paper. If you want to build something out of the chairs, feel free to do so. Please don't destroy the, the hall here and don't destroy the stage, but you can use whatever you find to come up with your prototypes. And trust me, it will be a lot of fun. We just need three rules for the collaboration. So the first rule is, if someone speaks, we don't interrupt. There's no but. There's only and. So don't interrupt ideas. And thirdly, you work as a team. And this all should probably lead for tomorrow. We might have the chance to pitch the best ideas on the stage in the end. So if you come up with something really good in the next 50 minutes, Feel free to approach us afterwards to have the chance to present your idea here. So you have met your team peers. You all set already? OK. So basically, we just take you through the process. Yeah? So you just have to follow the instructions step by step. So the first thing is, as I thought. Robin, just one second. I see you join later on. So what we're doing here is building up in groups, sitting together. So if you could join, this is one team, that's two, perhaps. Party, Laura, if you would like to group up yeah. uh, with the ladies in, lady in stripes, we could Fantastic. have. And there are the three persons joining in as well. So please join us in the interactive sessions. Uh, if you would like to, to remain as a team in three, that would be fantastic. So we would have then four teams. 
which would be working then throughout our design dash. Fantastic. So you didn't miss out much yet. So you, you three will be forming one team. <laughs> then it seems you know each other already well, so that's going to be a uh, vivid that's, group. That's work. a cold surprise, yeah? Fantastic. In the room that is cold, and then you get a cold surprise as well. So, <laughs> so welcome. Robin, you mind um, uh, remind them of the three main rules for the session here, and then we can kick it off. <laughs> so, it's all about dialogue. Ideas are not getting interrupted, so we don't say but, we only say and. And it's all about getting together as a team, yeah? So you're creating something together. These are the, the simple rules for, for the session. So step number one, you have three minutes for that. Our topic is SDG around innovation, infrastructure, and um, industry. So think about in your team, and everybody comes us with three ideas, problems, whatever comes to your mind around this SDG, and write them down. And in the end of the three minutes, you decide what is the biggest problem, the greatest opportunity you find in your first thoughts. So the three minutes are starting now. Write them down. Everybody's three ideas in the group. Five minutes, yes. First minute is over. One minute left. Thirty seconds, start choosing a topic that you want to work on in your team from your collection. What is the most promising thought that you have written down? Three seconds. And over. Time's up. Time's up. Everybody has a topic in their group? Yeah? No? And you're the expert group. <laughs> you have five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Topic. All right. Let's move on to the next step. And for the next step, you have seven minutes. And everybody, please, or every group, please decide on one person that you're going to send to another group for an interview session. So just send one person over to this group. This group sends someone over to this group. And you are going to send someone over to this group. OK? Decide who you're going to send the other group. 
Who is going to go to the other groups? Ah, you're joining as well, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, the three so you get Damien. Us. You get Damien for the interviews. All right. Yeah, you get the sharpest guy in the room here. <laughs> so Damien, if you could join the group for the interviews, please. So send someone over, please. Yes, so Patricia is there. You're going there. All right. OK. You're, someone is, has to go to this group as well. Yeah, you, you need an interview partner still. So we need an interview partner for this group in the middle. Who's going to go there? All right, your interview partner is coming. So for this interview partner uh, session, you are going to ask your interview partner around the topic that you have on your piece of paper. So ask all smart questions. What do they think about it? How do they relate to this topic? How do they feel about this topic? It's one topic that you have chosen before, and you just interview the person around this topic. So try to figure out what they think. So get the extra knowledge in the next seven minutes, yeah? Get all the knowledge from your interview partner. Time is starting now, seven minutes. Music starts as well.
three minutes left. One minute left. Five seconds. Interview time is over. The people that left their original group, please return to your original group. Thank you, Damien, for helping out. Everybody back in their original group? Fantastic. So based on your interviews now, describe the problem or the hypothesis that you're looking into a little bit more. So uh, the people that were interviewed, tell the people in your group what you have learned, what you have figured out, and then describe the person, right? So who have you talked with? What is their perspective on these topics, what do they express? And combined with your own thoughts, what do you think are the real problems, the real underlying causes, the symptoms um, that are causing the problem, yeah? So go into the depths. You have seven minutes time to come up with a problem hypothesis, yeah? Clear? And go. Patricia, you have a question? Yes, show your original group. So seven minutes, describe the problem as precise as possible.
Okay. No. Hello? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Last two minutes. Thirty seconds left. Time is over. I hope you're now a little bit clearer with the problems that we are facing and the problems that we are working on. If it seems still a little bit dusty and a little bit nebulous, that's fine, because that's part of a design dash. We don't want to go into depth yet, but we want to rapidly iterate over the topics. So next step is a drawing class. So, drawing class for Robin. <laughs> drawing, class, <laughs> yeah, drawing class for problems and solutions. So based on your problems, try to visualize the problem with a rough solution, right? You can draw it, whatever it comes to your mind. Try just to simply visualize it with pen and paper. And you have five minutes for that. It's not about an artistic masterpiece here. It's just about getting your thoughts on paper and visualize that. Five minutes, draw the problem with a rough solution around it. Five minutes, go. Uh, we just need one per group. We can do a nice picture for the camera.
One and a half minute left. Forty seconds left, finalize your artwork. All right, time is over. Please finalize your drawings. I hope they all look a little bit like Picasso. At least we hope for that, because we will take them with us home. <laughs> so you think this was creative and difficult? Now it's getting a little bit more difficult, because from a drawing, we want to come up now with a first prototype. And you only have pens and papers and chairs. You can do whatever you want with these chairs. Uh, we want to see something creative here. So for that, you have 10 minutes time. Come up with a prototype for your problem solution. And I'm really excited to see what you're coming up. 10 minutes, use whatever you find in the room. Good luck. So there's some plastic bottles here if you want to <laughs> use that as well. <laughs> Uh, take paper, tear it apart, fold it, shuffle it, staple things. Use what you have in your pockets. If you had an app, draw it. Take something from the bar if you need, but come quickly back. <laughs> Whatever you can find. Whatever you can find. Be creative. And think about the story behind it. If you build something out of chairs, you can have a story behind that, right? First minute is over. <laughs> You're done. I think you can use more chairs. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Looks fantastic. Oder 
Fuß gerutscht. Ja, besser aufstehen. All right, four minutes left. Four minutes.
one and a half minutes. You look really relaxed over there, so it seems like you have a good prototype. The time, the time is up, so now we're getting to the next stage where you again find the interview partners in the respective groups coming together and then you have to explain your prototype to the interview partner you had before. Yeah. So present, okay. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Now present your prototypes, gather the feedback, figure out what they think is good and what they think is bad, figure out what questions they have, and gather some new ideas. Because right afterwards, we will improve the prototype. <laughs> so interview partners, go to your groups again. All right, so just so. Make, to make it easier, exactly the same interview partners. So I'm joining yeah. you guys again. Exactly. The so Patricia over there. <laughs> For this next step, you have seven minutes. And the seven minutes start right now. Go. Oh, we don't have an interview partner for this group in the middle, right? You're missing an interview partner? Ah, there you are. OK, perfect. I think this is also a prototype here in the middle, right? Is this a proto your prototype, right? And you're alone now? Okay, so I come over to you as well and we see your prototype.
last minute And the time is over. So we're coming to the last step of the design dash. You have another seven minutes to improve your prototypes based on the feedback of this interview part. And afterwards, we are happy to have you present your prototypes. So another seven minutes to improve on your prototypes. Sort your thoughts, bring them on paper, write them down, and improve the prototypes. Seven minutes from now on. Have fun.
Okay, the fun is over. We're done. But you can continue the fun later today. But before we end the session, we want to see your prototypes. And that's why we're coming around. Do you want to start here right in the front presenting your prototype to us? For presentation, and can we get an audio signal on handheld microphone number one, please? Yeah, yeah, fine. Who wants to present? So You're going to present? Yeah, or, or, here you go. <laughs> here you go. So and your prototype is on the screen. Uh, handheld microphone one, please, audio signal. No, it should be switched on. It's on? Yeah. Yes, it's on. OK, awesome. So um, our topic was water scarcity. And the way that we were thinking of tackling it is um, we figured that the government doesn't actually have enough capacity to store that much water anyways. And through our interviews and group discussions, we decided to distribute that responsibility uh, onto the crowd. Right. So each house has its own storage facility not necessarily here, we're thinking about like how we want to plan it. So at the bottom, you'll see over here a container for the water, a filter to filter out gray water, th so things that we do through our uh, religious ablution, showers, so on and so forth, so the light kind of filtering that's actually needed. Um, this is the gray water that's not gray. <laughs> <laughs> and this is our house, and we were thinking, because of climate change, we're seeing a lot more rain here. It, it used to be a joke. Uh, which we used to say you're called Bahrain and there's not enough rain. But as you can see, the puddles of water around, yes, exactly. There's puddles of water around everywhere. And what is it doing? It's evaporating on the streets. So we were thinking that we could actually uh, collect that and, and store that for future use. Of course, we're still thinking about, you know, obviously this has a very big infrastructure change of how we're going to go on about it. And maybe uh, the group was discussing uh, we could do something on the level of uh, changing the behaviors and, and the way that they are actually consuming the water, maybe more efficient water usage um, on that level. And we also learned, very important, don't throw oil down the drain. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Really impressive for 50 minutes of prototyping. We have a new house. Thank you so much for presenting. And we're going to the next group. So you're going to have the next pitch. We have the next pitch with a palm tree. Who is going to do the palm tree pitch? Nora. Thank you. Okay, so um, we came up with modular housing, and our idea is cool container houses. So basically, you see our containers down there, but that's not where it ends. We're actually solving a lot of problems here because it's also a completely um, self sustaining system that is use using aquaponics. So you have a fountain here, and there are fish living in that fountain. And then the excrements of the fish, they feed the palm tree, so like the urban garden that you have on the rooftop of the discarded container. And you also have solar panels on the other container to supply the house with energy. And of course, there's 5G connection. So basically, it's great for people who never want to leave the house because there's, as um, <laughs> the people who gave us feedback said, um, there's food and Wi-Fi. Why would I ever want to leave? So, yeah. So you're trying... Yeah, and it solves the homelessness crisis, of course. Fantastic. So you're solving basically everything. Um, so this is like the prototype of the future, right, I would and then, say. And then, um, yeah, Damien, I think this side of the, the room was pretty impressive. Yeah, could, could you hand this over uh, for the microphone uh, uh, to yeah. the third group? I yeah. think we're going to have just three pitches then. The fourth group uh, had a distributed ledger for smart cities, which I was... Uh, part of uh, discussing, but I think they left already. So let's hear group number three. Assalamu alaikum. Actually, what our problem is regarding the trading in Bahrain, uh, entrepreneurships, there is much people to get as a startup. They are ready to be as a startup dealers, but there is no proper training, there is no proper mentoring getting on. So what we uh, given as three chairs over here, one is as a training institute, and one is job seekers, and one is like business owner. 
So business owner, what they want, they want the right person to work for them. And the job seeker, what they need, they need the right, uh, uh, right area where they have to fix to. But there is lack of information and technologies that we have to fix up to bring these groups all over together. So what we give the solution is like conducting the programs, training programs. It's in all over in public. Because as much as we know, the people who want to be a startup, they are not uh, going to some kind of uh, institute or something like that for a long course, like six months or one year or something like that, because they are very hardly trying to get breadwinning. Okay? And uh, grouping together, it should be under a roof that from uh, the institute, they have to take the, all the responsibility to get the job owner until the job seeker. And the third thing is what we can provide them is online training su support to both job owners and job seekers. Because they are, uh, as much as here in local market, what they are in, they are al already employed somewhere just as an employee, but they want to be a business startup. So online training, training what they will help to get information until there, will, there should be a proper proper follow-up uh, agenda that until the success. This is what we meant. OK, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. How cool is that that every th of you three groups came up with something totally different, which you can actually plug together as well to work in a larger ecosystem? Fantastic. For me, that's super impressive. So I hope someone heard this from uh, the Bahraini government so we can start implementing tomorrow. <laughs> Very good. So let's fantastic. start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, fantastic. I, I hope you could feel how things are evolving when we do design dashes. Because in the first probably 50 minutes, we could feel it from stage. Everybody was really confused. Everything feels really strange. This is like totally normal. But after 50 minutes, you came up with a prototype that visualizes really nicely problems and solutions. And that's the easiest way. And we didn't give you even some kind of resources. So just imagine what we all can do in 50 minutes if we have better infrastructure, better resources, and work together on the big topics. And Damien, I probably come back to your first sentence of the day. That's the tiny little stone that we can all move. So hope you enjoyed it. We do another design session in exactly 50 minutes and 18 seconds. So if you want to do another round, feel free to stay with us. Otherwise, tell all your friends or come to back tomorrow at 9-ish sharp. Thank you so much. Take care. Good afternoon. So for the last session today, we're going to do another design dash. So if you want to have some fun and come up with your own ideas, thank you very much nice for the microphone. <laughs> so we're going to do a design dash now. Um, there are a couple of you here in the room, and it would be great if you huddled into groups, because this is actually a session that is about collaboration. So if you, for instance, if you could join with a couple of people, if you're four or five per team, that's perfect. Yeah? Yeah, so okay. I see there is a group already f uh, forming over there. So we have one group over here, then maybe you can join. So okay. you can join each other. No, they're leaving. No, okay, don't they want to work. <laughs> Would you like to join that group over there? Perfect. So we have a second group over there. Good. Um, sir, with the blue sweater on the left, do you want? Do you, would you like to join that group as well? No. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> okay. I I hope our fellow shapers went outside together. Yeah, I think there are more people coming. So we're just gonna wait for a minute because I think there are more people coming. Your microphone is unstable. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that might. 
You can also come closer, yeah. I mean, you yeah. don't have to interact necessarily with us. The interaction will be within the group, but it's also nice to have you closer. Thank you so much. All right, so today's session is a design dash, and it's about SDG 11 and SDG 13. So it's about sustainable cities, and it's also about climate action, and you will be able to pick and choose like whatever topic you're interested in, in this realm, yeah, and come up with a cool idea. But um, yeah, we will get to that in a second, and we will take you by the hand through the process, and you're gonna have lots of fun, come up with funky ideas, and well, maybe your next startup idea at the end of this session. Just, just a quick question, how many of you ever heard of a design dash, know what a design dash is? Okay, one. That's totally fine. You don't need to have any previous knowledge. Everything will be explained to you step by step, okay? Sounds great. Sounds great. Yeah. Start? Cool. Yeah, let's let's give it a start. All right. So we're going to start with the first part of the design dash. There are also a couple of rules in general for you, so don't say but. There's only end, because you want to generate ideas. And also, please um, keep in mind that you don't interrupt each other, that you always let each other finish, um, because it's about brainstorming. So the first part is about meeting your peers. So you can use your phone, or you can use, there's a couple of pen and paper lying around. You can use that to just jot down three thoughts uh, regarding sustainable cities and or climate action that you can come up with. Whether that's ideas or problems or things you've always thought about, doesn't matter. And it's really important now that you maybe get together a bit closer as a group so you can also actually talk to each other. May I also make a suggestion? So I see there is a bigger group forming over here and there are some new people who join. It will be great if we can have rather groups of four people so that we can have even more uh, brainstorming groups going on. So okay, I see here a group of three. Maybe you would like to join this group yeah. here. Amazing, great. And then you five ladies, you form one group? Yeah, so it seems. Okay. Yeah? That sounds good. So, so, you, have... so you and you, and then we have four groups in total? Yeah, yes? because we Perfect. have one over there as well. Would Super. you like to join in the back as well? Just join one of the groups. Or you can start just watching, and then you'll see whether it's something for you. Yeah? Cool. <laughs> All right. So just quickly again, jot down three thoughts or ideas or problems on paper by yourself that you think relate to sustainable cities and climate action. And once you've done that, discuss within the groups, like share it and decide which, which of these thoughts is the most interesting one. And you have to work fast here. You have three minutes starting now. Okay. Don't forget, once you have written down the biggest issues you think relate to sustainable cities and climate action, that you discuss it within your group and you try to find maybe one issue that you all feel is really important on. There is like one issue which is the most important of all of them. So once you've write in, written it down, please just talk to your peers and see what the others have written.
So you should start talking with each other now. So you have a group over here. You, you are part of that group, I think, the four of you. So you should start talking with each other and sharing ideas now. I can also go and ask them if they are comfortable with that. Oh, there's one more group. Is it all cute? Huh? Is it all cute? Like, you, you know what you're going to do? OK, super. Seconds left, hurry up. <laughs> All right, you need to wrap it up now. All right, time's up. Have you come up with the most interesting thought? Right now, it just has to be a thought. Yes? OK, remember, the idea here in the end is to come up with like a business idea and with a prototype. So we're going to go to step two now. Interview a person. This means that from each group, one of you will go to another group, yeah? So one of you will go to this group, one of you will go to that group, one of you will go to that group, and then the other way around. And then the remaining group members will interview the new person on the thought that you have come up with. So you have come up with a thought, right? And then someone new comes in and you will ask them, you will explain your thought and you will ask them about it. What do they think? Any question you want to ask. OK? It's going to be an interview for the person who's going to join your group. All right, so okay? one of you has to join this group now. You are going over there. Perfect. Uh, Laura Emanuel, is one of you going to the other group? And may I ask, so the two guys who just joined, why don't you merge just into this group? So, so that we form Perfect. a bigger group. Okay. And then, uh, Damien. Damien, one of your group members has to come over there. Do you all have a new member in your group, a new person that you're going to interview now? Or is there anyone missing? That group, is, are you good? Is there a new person with you? OK, so you just joined. You can still act as uh, the interviewee. Yeah, just come over. Great. All right. Oh, I, start. I forgot to stop it. So again, just to repeat this part of the exercise, you have to interview the new person who just joined the group, asking this person about the issue that you came up with, understanding, uh, consider this person as being your user, your potential user, and try to learn as much as you can about the problem he's facing. If you're new to the room and you want to take part, just join one of the groups and just uh, listen in and share your thoughts.
was Robin that I wasn't. <laughs> it's like the other guy who looked like Robin this morning. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. She's standing again. She was there for the other design dash. Hmm? She was there for the other design dash. Mm -hmm. Just for the first one. That's mm -hmm. so cute. I met, by the way, I met the um, founding curator of the hub in Zimbabwe. Because uh, he was like, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm with a group organization called the Ocean. So I can't question it. Post it, I'm sure there are so many shoppers we don't even know about. Mm -hmm. And they can take part and join us. Mm. Oh, that's a huge group. <laughs> and taking pictures and everything. Mm -hmm. If you're new to the room, um, just join one of the teams and just listen in because we're doing like an interactive session here. We're doing a design dash. So don't be, um, don't be afraid. Just join one of the teams and uh, yeah, take part. We're doing a design dash here on the SDGs on sustainable cities and climate action. So we're trying to come up with ideas for new um, business models. We promise it's fun. Are you tired? Mm -hmm. Are you tired? Because you're a bit like that. <laughs> I'm cold and also a bit like that. Yeah, but not like that. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. I'm not I want to change my assessor for my thesis. I want to change my assessor for my thesis. Yeah, I have a lot going on with this hospitation period. I'm also with the like wedding prep and I don't even know. Yeah, of course I'm trying a little bit. Yeah, it's just like the worst questions that pop up in the last two days. And it's like, well, I didn't read all of this. Just so there was this point on whether we can use Hub's money to pay the, money? the Hub's money okay. to pay for the ticket for the speaker. Oh. And also what Damien told me, which I agree with, is like NBF is the project that allows us to raise money. You should make up money, right? Yeah. To then subsidize other mm -hmm. projects. We, yeah, I mean, for this one, weren't able to, or like, didn't just work out. We did a good job to be able to sponsorship and stuff. And I feel like we've been a little bit shy in asking for sponsorship. Yeah, but the issue is also circular economy. It's more like it's not that much a business topic, at least at the moment. Yeah, but yeah, the thing is for me, I think I think we uh, we just suck with our time. So you should be wrapping it up with your interviews. You have one minute left. For me, it's more like so curatorship thing. Like I try to really start it off well. Mm -hmm. So I've been like in touch with the newbies and also participating in calls. And I remember when we had the call for Hack for a Cause, it was like my fifth shapers call that day. Yeah, exactly. I was freaking I was really, don't ask me to do anything more. And then, you know, also we are organizing this offsite and yes, Tarek is in charge, but at the same time, find the venue and 
what type of accommodation to go for and there are apartment things and like small things and currently coming up oh my gosh the website is not updated we want to establish a partnership can you help us mm -hmm. finding the presentations and stuff and I just feel like like every day I have so many different groups that require like a reaction on things okay your time is up so uh, the person who went to the group and was interviewed should go back to the group where he or she came from. And we are going to explain you the next step. So please just go back to your room, uh, your room, your group. <laughs> the time started already. Yeah, it's fine. What is now? So you should now have the person that you send out as an envoy to the other group. That person should have now come back. Yep. And you can quickly update them. And then you should come up with a one sentence description of your problem that you are discussing in your group. Like what is it that you're working on? and. You should also ask the person that was not previously in the group, what do they actually think about the problem? And you should also evaluate your interview that you were having. Does it make sense? Yes? Okay, try to come up with one sentence. So what do you think the person that you interviewed, what do you think they wanted to express? What do you think is like the main issue that you're working on. Root cause. Hmm? The root cause. Do you think they're working? It's just tiny because I think otherwise we're running too late. And then it's like priorities, we have to, this event came first, so we have to focus on that. Yeah, yeah I think I just have to like cold call history. I worked on a rework sponsoring package, and I think now we just have to send it out to you guys, like just send out 20 emails, and even if it's to info it. The thing is we have a bunch of conference speakers, like the event will fly, we might not have a catering, but we have the location, we have speakers. Like the process is like, it's also, you know, some people keep saying, yeah, they will do it, and then it's like, oh, sorry, I didn't get a chance to do it, and you know, it's so, but that's always the problem. At the same time, this is a bit where I feel it perhaps was more, like it was important to have the more leadership 
because you and Sylvia are in touch, so you should be making sure that everything. Yeah, like also, I, I see at the execution of Laura. Laura is super good at executing shit, mm -hmm. and she like she really keeps it together. So maybe she has also time to do it. Or, you know, she is preparing the wedding, or she's not changing her job. There, there has to be like strong leadership in yeah. projects, and I felt it was more like yeah. Also the fact that like, everyone is doing everything in their way and like not so much accountability. It was good. Yeah, I think for me really it's like it's not my priority. But it's not my priority. It can't be. So it's a challenge. Like to run the goal I didn't expect. So missing startups, right? Like, who are the startups who are coming to pitch? Or, like, I don't know. I felt it's, for example, we didn't create, this is my fault, we didn't create also the Facebook event yet, or like, mm -hmm. we didn't send out, start sending out invitations on Facebook. Okay, you have one, less than one minute left. We should, let, let's focus on this. Yeah, I know what you mean that, oh, we have an interesting group coming home. Mm -hmm. Should we t tell them something? Mm -hmm. Should we tell them something? Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm so shy. So now that you have come up with your um, problem and your hypothesis, it is now actually time to start prototyping. So um, what is your solution? So now it's time to get your pen and paper and to start drawing your solution, your idea, your business model, whatever it is. Draw it on pen and paper and try to visualize it. And it's important, don't draw the problem, but draw what you think is the solution to the problem. Draw your prototype. You have five minutes for this. It doesn't have to be a work of art. It's really just about putting it on paper and, and visualizing it for all of us. solution to the problem, yes. So, you know, you're inventing a new product or a service. Or what is your problem or like what is the problem you're trying to solve? Waste management. Waste in general? Yeah, waste management. Try maybe to be a bit specific, maybe if there is one specific type of waste you would like to, it could be like electronic waste. Yes, 
Try to go narrow, like uh, something that you can then present as a business model. Are you guys drawing? Ooh, nice drawing. It's a, it's a Japanese process. Oh. Yeah. It's, a, it's our waste management. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, uh, so you guys have similar ideas. Good. Have two minutes left. How's it going? You're the artist? <laughs> All right. <laughs> two minutes, guys. Right, less than one more minute until we go to the final stage. So now we're entering the final stage. Now that you have your idea on paper, we actually want you to bring your prototype to life. What does that mean? Use anything to ha you have here in the room and try to build your prototype. You can use pen and paper, you can use the coffee cups, you can use the chairs or yourselves, whatever you find in your pockets and try to build your prototype. Okay? Just don't dismantle the cameras. I'm afraid that might be a problem for the guys. But use whatever you have around you to really show us what your solution looks like. There are no limits. Be creative.
showing like this is actually the URL which is just not going into like where it just collects. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see. Mm -hmm. What type of feedback did they give on our house? They liked it. They just said they uh, said that we made a show that we just saw so that we approved it to enter solar panels. So we came up with the whole aquaponics system in the end. <laughs> this is just the uh, our Egyptian friend. Sir, the, the person who just came in the room. Hello. Mm. Hi there. You can just join one of the groups and just listen in if you would like to know what we are doing. the dinner to explain me later. I, is it done like this? Like, so this <laughs> Good. Okay. It's fun. Okay. But you know, you also pay for to build up stuff. And so uh, you can ask for a tape over there. It's you don't need it there, but then you take it further. Where is your prototype? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, there's some serious art stuff going on. All right, I see. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, but you shouldn't distract them. You know, they're mm -hmm. here to work. They're here to create solutions for climate change. It's like, yeah. Let's do this. you know, priorities, man. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ooh. So this represents a person. Yeah, right? Yeah. And there's the car, right? This is a car. Very interesting. And that is a part of the project. Oh. Oh, that's the whole process. I see. I see. Okay. Cool. Uh, you like you, you need a lot of imagination. <laughs> No, no, I'm really impressed. I'm honestly really impressed. Yeah, where's your prototype? Is you <laughs> an apple and a flower? Yeah. All right, I really need to hear that then. <laughs> Makes a difference. Yeah, because I think it's like black and white design is just too like so many things that you want to do, black and white, mm -hmm. and like that. With which one does like want to suggest in the end? Like and simplicity works. Simplicity is usually better than if you like because also otherwise people don't look at the people on stage anymore and they just try to decide on the slide. I hope you're almost done with your prototypes. You have one minute left. All right, time's up for your prototype. Now we will move to the next step. Uh, do you remember that there was one person from your group who had to go to the other group and was asked a question about the problem that you were addressing? So that person now has to go back to the group that interviewed him or her and look at the prototype. So you have to explain to this person what is the prototype, like what is your solution to the problem, and then also get feedback. Because don't forget that the interviewee was ultimately your user. So he or she needs to you know, tell you whether she likes it or not, uh, what could be improved, whether maybe there are some things which still remain unsolved. So please, the person who migrated from the group to go back to that group and see what they have done to solve your issue. And you have, again, seven minutes for that. OK. <laughs> the group in the back, is there anyone who is moving to? Check the prototype of our group here in the corner. 
Yeah, I think that was the, the young boy. Would you like to join a group just to see what they're doing? Yeah, yeah, you can listen in. For the what? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Probably it's with some other people, it's but if you want, you can just listen in um, because we're doing some co-creation stuff. So just, just sit there. And Said, oh, you might even get the chance to put your project tomorrow to read in the Roman media class. So if you want to meet tomorrow, but they need to come back. Maybe we can ask them.
this is not on household level, this might be at least neighborhood level. So, so there's an important component to it, which is really awareness raising and really getting people to, to throw this organic waste in a proper way and also just do it, right? All right, you slowly need to wrap up. Okay, I, I think we're good to go. But yeah, thanks a lot for explaining that to me, thanks. Nora. I'm Alan. Is there an Alan in the group? So before Anna. we wrap up, Who's you Anna? now get the last chance based on the interviews that you just conducted to improve your prototype. And we will shorten that, that bit a little bit because we don't have that much time left. Um, and we will then also get the quick chance that one of each group presents to the audience what you have actually come up with, okay? So that we all uh, know what you've worked on. Should we do like three minutes to improve the prototype yeah. and then we present briefly, okay. All right, guys, please wrap it up. Um, and I'm now going to come downstairs so that each group gets a quick 30 seconds pitch to explain what you've actually worked on. That would be amazing. Um, do you guys want to start? You? Just to explain what your idea is so the others, uh, so you can share it with the others. Oh, you'll be fine. Is it not on? Okay. Just speak loud. So we have the emission of CO2. Uh, there is two, uh, the problem is in the cars. So the solution for the cars is uh, limiting their timing and using 
hybrid cars or hydrogen. So here we demonstrated the timing to <laughs> limit the timing, like from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. and then only the cars. Okay. This is the sun, the moon, and this is the sun rising. <laughs> and the other one, she will explain. Um, my problem was growing a uh, lack of greenery and high emission levels. So the solution was to grow greenery and trees everywhere. It could be in the form of ivy on the side of buildings or lush gardens on the roofs of buildings. Electric cars are also not as eco-friendly as they appear because generating electricity produces like a lot of smoke in the factories. And for this reason, we could start using cars that run on water or hydrogen. It's much more eco-friendly and you can even drink the water that comes out of it. Thank you. All right, we have a couple more groups. So our group here, uh, we want to solve the problem of food waste. So globally, every single year, 1.3 billion tons of uh, food have been thrown away. So it's a huge amount. And uh, I think the same problem here in Bahrain as well. Uh, so we have a solution for that. Uh, the technology is not new. Uh, so it's basically food waste thrown into this prototype here. <laughs> And then uh, through combustion, it will become a gas as fuel. Um, and then the, the remaining charred items will be used as fertilizers for the soy. Cool. Um, but what, what's the innovation to this is the packaging of it. Because uh, at the moment now, it's all look very industrialized, um, not really kid friendly. So we're going to make it really kid friendly. We're going to explore doing it in the, in the neighborhood in Bahrain uh, with 300 households that we're targeting and uh, making it look cute such that you know, rather than um, a machine they are, they, are, they are throwing food into, it becomes like maybe a, a pet um, cat or something like that. And make, make it look cute such that even the, the whole household, even the kids themselves are also involved in um, you know, upscaling this, uh, upcycling these food items. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so, mu so much for sharing your idea. That's great. We have um, two more groups, I believe. Do you also want to quickly share your idea? You're going to do it? OK, so we're having a waste management cycle here. And uh, it's a traditional one, but uh, we had some feedback here for improvements. So we uh, implemented uh, some sensors and uh, data analysis software to uh, measure our efforts and improve on the process and maybe uh, make decisions on uh, where to fix things if they're not mm -hmm. working properly. So it's a, a good uh, final <laughs> collaborative effort. Your new startup idea, basically. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. And now, last but not least. OK, last but not the least, probably uh, not very, uh, you can say, money generating and all, but we have kept it very simple, wherein we can cost the cost as well. So the idea is flowers. There are a lot of flowers being used at events and a lot of other functions. So general life of a flower is seven days, OK? When we do an event, we just use them for one day, and rest after, we don't use them. So idea is, you have used it for one day, give it to us. We put that into one of the retail outlet or online, and we sell it. When we sell it from that money, we do charity, OK? If the customer has bought it, it's good enough. If he has not bought it, we'll actually put this into ground and make more fertilizer and do the agriculture again. We put these flowers, those who are generated from there, back into the market. And I'm pretty sure you would like to add something more? That's about it. Sure. And one more thing, when a new customer buys something from our outlet, they might want to add something like deposit some sort of flowers that they got or from their friends. So they can, as we see here, this is both sided. They might throw some flowers into a box that may, we may reuse and then supply to future customers that may be interested. They might help us with our efforts. Um, anyway. So you're really creating yeah. the circular yeah. economy there. Yeah. I agree. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much for all of your efforts. Um, this was really fun. Thank you so much. Guys, we will be having more sessions tomorrow, starting from 9 AM, where we will be here to give you an impulse session 
collection. So again, it will be a mix of panels. There will be one more design dash as well if you found this fun and please join us. Yeah, I think you said everything that was left to say. Uh, just a reminder, we are the Global Shapers and we are here to really get you guys to work. We don't want this passive interactions when there is just a panel sitting there showering you with information. We really want you to get something out of these sessions. So please join us tomorrow. We are here the whole day and we'll be glad to see you again. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Peace.